Good afternoon and welcome to the fourth day of the fifth annual conference of the Race, Inequality and Language in Education program at Stanford University. This year's theme focuses on pursuing educational equity in uncertain times. We began the week with Dr. Linda Darling Hammond and our other speakers, Dr. Ledesma and Dr. Pierman, talking about policy issues related to these times. Tuesday's session brought together an amazing group of scholars who focused on educational abolition. These scholars talk about a revolutionary way of looking at challenges that we're facing during these times. And yesterday's session focused on an indigenous view of the moment of crisis that we currently find ourselves in relating to COVID-19, racism, online teaching, learning anxiety, and other disruptions to the lives of individuals already living in unequal circumstances. Today's session will challenge us to think about issues related to COVID-19 and race. So we will turn our attention immediately to the issues at hand. It's my pleasure to introduce our Ryle graduate student host for today's webinar. Catherine Rebai is a PhD student in curriculum and teacher education, looking at science education specifically here in the GSE. She is a former high school chemistry teacher. Catherine's re recent research is pushing the envelope on the application of social justice principles to secondary chemistry education. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Dr. Ball. It is such an honor to introduce the panel of scholars today to introduce um, and discuss the critical topic of COVID-19 race and education. Today's session is especially important because we know that the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic can't be disentangled from race, especially when we look at the disparate effects that it has had on black, brown, and indigenous communities. And we also know that health and health care can't be disentangled from education. This year has put public health and medical science in the center of public discourse. And it's also highlighted the need for education that develops an understanding of injustices that have always been tied to science and medicine. Today's panel gives us a chance to examine the idea that while these COVID times may be uncertain, the additional burden they place on communities of color is not so unprecedented. Today's keynote will be given by Dr. David R. Williams. Dr. Williams is the Florence Sprague Norman and Laura Smart Norman Professor of Public Health and Chair of the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. He's also a professor of African and African-American studies and sociology at Harvard University. His research focuses on the social influences of health and the complex ways in which socioeconomic status, race, stress, and religious involvement can affect health. He has received many awards and honors. And to highlight just a few, he's been elected to the National Academy of Medicine in 2001, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2007, and to the National Academy of Sciences in 2019. Following the keynote, Dr. Williams will be joined by Dr. Michael Hines and Dr. Karen Dell. Dr. Michael Hines is an assistant professor at Stanford Graduate School of Education, where his research centers the history of education, curriculum studies, social studies and civics education, and the history of childhood. His current research focuses on how African-Americans in the early 20th century created new curricular discourses around race and historical representation. Dr. Bell is an assistant professor at Tulane School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine. Her research focuses on the unique impacts of socioeconomic status and place on cardiovascular disease as risk factors in Black Americans and on racial disparities in health. She also examines how place shapes structural racism in the US and the implications for Black health and racial health inequity. I'm so excited to hear from these scholars today. 
And we also invite you to join in the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag Ryle2020. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Williams for our keynote presentation. Thank you so very much. It's truly an honor to be here with you today and to participate in this important panel. I, I thank um, Dr. Ball for her uh, invitation uh, to be here. We were great colleagues <laughs> many years ago at the University of Michigan together, and I always am happy to support anything that she's doing because of the quality uh, of the, that program. So I'm going to share my screen and, and jump right into my talk so that we can uh, stay on, on, on track uh, with uh, what we are trying uh, to accomplish um, here today. Um, you should be able to see my screen okay. Um, we're going to talk about race and racism and how all of these factors play out powerfully in COVID-19. So let's begin with some data. Um, what's the, the deaths from COVID-19? Uh, this is through October 13th. Um, and this is by race and this is national data for the United States. And what it shows, you can see, is the elevated rates for African Americans and Latinos. Um, it, it's hard to wrap your head around what these death rate differences mean. So this puts them in a way that you, you really get a sense of what we're talking about. If all ethnic groups had died at the same rate of, as white Americans, at least 21,800 Black Americans who died would not have died. 11,400 Latino Americans who died would still be alive, and over 750 Indigenous Americans would be alive. So that those are fairly racial uh, differences in health. And I make the point that around the globe, race matters for health. The U.S. is not, in fact, unique. Here is data um, uh, showing the odds ratios uh, from COVID-19 for men in the United Kingdom. This is uh, the, the gap. Black men in the UK are 4.2 times more likely to die um, than, than, than white men in the UK. Uh, men from Bangladeshi, Pakistani, 3.6 times more likely. Those from India, 2.4 times more likely. And if we look at the data uh, for, for women, the pattern is very similar. So actually, if you saw the data I just showed of the black-white gap in the U.S., it's it's almost three, uh, it's almost three times higher. And you can see in the U.K., in spite of access to the National Health Service, it's even larger. Uh, we can come back to that as what are the factors that have to be addressed in in understanding and and addressing uh, this problem. I, I want to make the important point: COVID nineteen has shown a bright light, a magnifying glass, if you wish on racial disparities in health, but they didn't create them. They have existed for a long time. And, and I would argue that COVID-19 uh, disparities that we see were totally predictable. Here is an example, infant mortality rates in the US in 2015. Uh, infant mortality refers to a baby dying before they, and you can see that black babies are more than twice as likely to die before their first birthday than white babies, and also a markedly elevated risk for Native Americans. Uh, just to show you, it's it's a pattern. Here is data for England, and you can see blacks from Africa, blacks from the Caribbean, Pakistanis have markedly elevated rate of death. So we are left with a question: What drives these large racial inequities in health? Um, and I would say. Um, there are large racial inequities in socioeconomic status. And when I say socioeconomic status, I'm referring to differences by income, education, occupational status, uh, or wealth. Um, and globally, socioeconomic status is one of the largest predictors of variation in health. And in fact, in the U.S., racial inequities in socioeconomic status are larger than most people think. I would say it's, they're clearly larger than most of my students think. So here is data by education from the U.S. Census, the percent of Americans aged 25 and older who have a bachelor's degree. And you can see that's true about almost one third of whites, but about 18 percent of African-Americans, 13 percent of Latinos, 15 uh, percent of Pacific Islanders, 13 percent of Native Americans and 50 percent of, of Asian-Americans. So so large differences by education um, showing uh, data for 2018, income data, 
uh, median household income by race. And I'm just put it in a way you can't miss the point. I'm standardizing on, an, on, on the income of white households as $1. For every dollar of household income, white households receive, Asian households receive $1.23. Two factors to keep in mind. One is Asian households, almost 70% are immigrants. They've come to the US with very high levels of education. And number two, Asian households have more persons contributing to household income than any other racial group. So if I had done a per capita or per person measure of income, whites would have the highest. But let's look at the historically disadvantaged groups. For every dollar of household income, white households earned in 2018 before the pandemic started, Latino households earn 73 cents, and Native American and African American households earn 59 cents. Do you know what is striking or stunning about the 59 cents figure for Blacks? That gap in 2018 is identical to the racial gap in income, the Black-white gap in income in 1978. You heard me right. I did not misspeak. I said 1978. And why did I pick 1978? 1978 was the peak year of the narrowing of the black-white gap as a result of the war on poverty and the civil rights policies of the 60s and 70s. The gap had narrowed to 59 cents. And I'm saying in 2018, the gap is 59 cents. Has it been stable over time? No throughout the decade of the 1980s. Reaganomics was not good for Black America. And it was not until 1994 that it got back up to the 59 cents figure, and it's been a penny up and down since. And as bad as these racial differences in income are, they dramatically understate racial differences in economic circumstances. And what do I mean by that? Well, income captures the flow of resources into the households, your salary, your wages. It tells us nothing about the economic reserves that households have to cushion shortfalls of income. We get that from data of wealth that captures your, 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 your savings, your investments, uh, your, your home equity. Um, so looking at, at all of the financial assets. And this is the latest data from the Federal Reserve Board. Uh, for every dollar of wealth that white households have, Black households have pennies and Latino households have 12 pennies. When my career started, most researchers thought that these racial differences in health were simply a function of racial differences in income education. And if we looked at persons at this, of, of different races at the same level of income and education, race wouldn't matter. We now know that life is more complicated and that there is an added burden of race. And I'm going to illustrate that for you with national data for the United States, life expectancy at age 25. That's at age 25, how many more years will the average person live? Well, the average white person in the U.S. will live five years longer than the average African-American at age uh, 25. So there's the five-year racial gap. However, the gap by education within whites is 6.4 years. Whites with a college degree or more education will live 6.4 years longer than whites who have not finished high school. And African-Americans with a college degree or more education will live 5.3 years longer than, than African-Americans who have not finished high school. The important take-home point, and this is true for most health outcomes, is that the socioeconomic gap is bigger than the racial gap. At the same time, this is not an either or conversation. We need to look at both. Because at every level of education, it's also true for income, but in the interest of time, I'm only showing you the education data. Race still matters. So white high school dropouts at age 25 live 3.1 years longer than black high school dropouts. And the gap widens as education increases. And this is stunning statistic for the United States. Not a sample. This is national data. The best of African Americans, those with a college degree or more education, have lower life expectancy with a college degree, lower life expectancy than whites with some college, lower life expectancy than whites who have finished high school. So what does these data tell us? There's something about income and education that drives your health regardless of your race, but there's something else about race that matters profoundly after we've taken income and education and weaving wealth into account. 
And so I and a group of researchers have been asking the question, could racism, not race, but racism, be a critical missing piece of the puzzle to understand the patterning of racial disparities in health? And when I use the term racism, I am referring to an organized social system, one that categorizes and ranks, differentially allocates opportunities and resources to different groups. Yes, it's premise of an ideology of inferiority and a ranking of populations, and it can lead to negative attitudes and beliefs, and it can lead to discrimination by individuals and societal institutions, but we are primarily dealing with a system. And I want to talk about that system today and one mechanism of that system that, that is spawning inequality. To understand that, I think it's important to distinguish between individual discrimination and discrimination based in institutions and policies, it's systemic, structural, institutional, are different terms used. I want to give you one concrete example. This is the time when we are thinking about a presidential election. So here's a study that was done in 2012, national data for the United States, 2012 presidential election. How long did Americans stand in line to vote? On average, African Americans waited 23 minutes in line to vote. Whites waited 12 minutes. You can see the differences for other groups. Importantly, none of these differences reflected discrimination or bad treatment on the part of low workers. Instead, heavily driven by where you vote and what was the budget allocated, what was the space constraint, what was the staffing of the polling site? Uh, how much, how large a population uh, did things serve? It was a bunch of budgeting, administrative, bureaucratic procedures. The people who administered the policies uh, were treating everyone the same, but you saw there were striking differences in outcome, even though individually, the individuals were treating everyone fine. I have written in my career a lot about residential segregation. A 2001 paper said it is the fundamental cause of racial disparities in health. And we are kidding ourselves that we will address these inequities without addressing residential segregation. Well, it's a legacy of racism. It's a mechanism, one of these systemic mechanisms that has profound effects. John Sell was a at Duke University, he wrote a book about the origins of segregation in the U.S. South and South Africa. He showed that the framers of apartheid in South Africa looked across the Atlantic in the early 20th century and they saw residential segregation in the United States and they said, brilliant, we will implement that in our country. Importantly, Sell argues that residential segregation was one of the most successful domestic policies of the 20th century in the U.S. Why? It's beneath the greatest screen. But when segregation shows up in a neighborhood, a lot of valuable resources disappear, like high quality schools and safe playgrounds and good jobs and healthy water and safe housing and transportation and high quality medical care. You want empirical evidence? I will give you some. These are two of my colleagues at Harvard, William Julius Wilson and Robert Sampson. They completed a national study in 1995, the 171 largest cities in America. And because of segregation, there's not even where white equal conditions to blacks and the worst urban context in which whites reside is considerably better than the average context of black communities. And someone said, Professor Williams, that's 1995 data. How have things gotten better over time? I'm going to share the, the work of another uh, former colleague, Dr. Dolores Acevedo Garcia, now at Brandeis University. She has created uh, uh, the diversitydatakids.org database looked at every county in the United States and ranked it on 24 indicators of opportunity for children, the high quality of elementary schools, um, the, the graduation rate, um, the income level, employment level, home ownership rates, the quality of the physical environment, air, water, soil, pollution, uh, green space, healthy food outlets, walkability. 24 indicators, and I've given you some of them here. This is what she finds, and this is February 2020. This is what she finds. In the 100 largest metropolitan areas in this country, 67% of all black children are living in very low or low opportunity neighborhoods. And that's also true of 58% of Latino kids and 53% 
of Native American kids compared to about one in five white and Asian. On the flip side, if you look at the high end, who is residing in high and very high opportunity neighborhoods, 65 percent, uh, almost two thirds of all white and Asian kids are in that context. So what we are showing is that access to a broad range of opportunities are powerfully patterned by place as the law of segregation. In fact, empirical evidence indicates that segregation has created even those income and education and wealth differences that I showed you to begin with. They are not independent of racism. They are the manifestation of racism. Here is a study done by David Cutler, a Harvard economist using national data for the United States, black and, and whites. He shows statistically with fancy econometric models, if you could eliminate residential segregation, you would completely erase in America black-white differences in income, in education and unemployment, and reduce black-white differences in motherhoods by two-thirds, because all of those differences to opportunity at the neighborhood level. And you say, well, that was a 1997 study. What do we know today? So here is another Harvard economist, Raj Chetty. That's a wonderful opportunity index that you can look at. He has done an amazing study. He linked census tracts in America from 1989 to 2015. And he is looking at the generational uh, uh, transfer of, 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 of inequalities in income. So he's looking at black and white households that begin at the same level of income. And he finds in 99% of black of census tracts in this country, blacks who begin at the same income as whites, their children are earning less money. 99% of census tracts. Black boys do as well as white boys in neighborhoods with good resources. But essentially that's found in only 1% of the neighborhoods where blacks live in this country. So what are we dealing with then? The racial inequities that we see in economic status that matter for life and health do not reflect a broken system. Instead, they reflect a carefully crafted system functioning as planned, successfully implementing social policies, many of which are rooted in racism. They are not accidental random events, they are not acts of God. Racism has produced a truly rigged system in the United States. And when you are in low status and living in segregated neighborhoods, it means we are all in the same pandemic, we're in the same storm, but we are not in the same boats. And some boats are much more equipped and able to handle the storm than others. And so what the impact of low economic status and COVID not everyone can work from home. For persons who, who, who work in non-salary jobs, if you don't show up for work, there is no money. In poor neighborhoods with overcrowded housing, social distancing is not a viable option. And studies reveal that a high proportion of the essential workers in this country are persons of color in the United States. And what the research also reveals, that when you live in low economic, of lower economic status, in disadvantaged, segregated neighborhoods with high exposure to racism, you have higher levels of stress, difficulty making and meet at the end of the month, higher likelihood of unemployment, greater exposure to psychosocial stresses, the death of a loved one and other challenges, higher levels of discrimination and higher levels of physical chemical stresses. Let me give you a couple quick examples. This matters profoundly for health. This is a study by some of my colleagues at Harvard University. They have shown that poor and minority individuals in places at higher risk of air pollution. And if you have high air, live in an area of high air pollution, you are more vulnerable to COVID-19. And if you get it, it's much more severe. And if you get it, you're more likely to die of it. The impact of chemical toxic stressors. Martin Luther King talked about discrimination, that it knows that Negro in every waking moment of their lives. If this hypothesis is true, then discrimination could have negative consequences for health. Here is a scale that I developed called the Everyday Discrimination Scale, widely used globally now. And what's powerful about it, it doesn't capture all aspects of discrimination, just, just some aspects. 
little indignities on a day-to-day -day basis, treated with less courtesy and respect than others, receiving poorer service than others at restaurants or stores, people acting as if they think you are not smart or if they're afraid of you or if they think you are dishonest or they're better than you are. Little ways in which your dignity is chipped away every day. I wanna show you just a, some examples. There are more than 200 published peer-reviewed papers looking at everyday discrimination, linking it to health outcomes. And I wanna show you what this research has found, just some of them. If you score high on a scale of everyday discrimination, you're more likely to be a new case of cardiovascular disease, more likely to get breast cancer, or more likely to get type 2 diabetes, or more likely to engage in a number of high-risk behavior, more likely to have heart rate variation, coronary artery calcification. These are subclinical indicators of heart disease, more likely to have high blood pressure, more likely to have problems with sleep quality and sleep duration, uh, more likely to have multiple biomarkers of functioning, like higher levels of inflammation that puts you at risk for chronic disease, and higher levels of stress hormones like cortisol, higher levels of obesity, uh, lower engagement with the healthcare system, system and more mental disorders. What all of these risk factors do is that they put populations of color at higher risk. Here are terms that are being used in the literature to describe this higher risk. Accelerated aging is one, premature aging, biological weathering. What do these researchers mean by these terms? Let me talk about Arlene Geronimus at the University of Michigan and, and weathering. She is making the point that your chronological age, how age you are, how much age your birth certificate says you are, captures not only how long you have, you have lived. When you are a disadvantaged, stigmatized race, member of a racial population in this, in this country, it's also capturing how long you have been exposed to bad environmental conditions and how physiologically compromised you have become as a result of such exposure. Think of weathering. Imagine a drop of water from the rooftop of the building you are sitting in on the sidewalk below. If water drip, drip, drip today, that's no big deal. But if day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out, there's a steady drip, drip, drip of water, the sidewalk, would become weathered. It would become eroded by the constant exposure to adversity. And research is documenting that in these United States, at the same chronological age, African Americans in some studies are seven and a half years older, biologically, physiologically than whites, in some studies 10 years older. And these are studies that are looking at telomere length and other biomarkers uh, of, of aging to capture uh, that phenomenon. And all of this leads to the earlier onset of chronic disease. This is data from the CDC. At age 50 to 64, 41% of whites have high potential compared to 61% of African Americans. Remember, the stresses that I looked at are all predictors of early onset of hypertension. It's not happening by accident. Diabetes, age 50 to 64, 23% of African Americans in that age group have diabetes compared to 14% of whites, and that pattern exists for a broad range of outcomes. How does this play out for COVID-19? Here is a large study done in New York City of um, uh, nearly 6,000 patients in 12 New York hospitals. 57% of all patients hospitalized for COVID-19 in these 12 hospitals had high blood pressure. 42% had obesity. 34% um, had diabetes. 18% had heart disease. In fact, only 6% had none of those conditions and only 6% had one. So 88% of all people hospitalized had two or more. And that puts them at greater risk for COVID-19 and for a broad range of factors that adversely impact health. So let me wrap up quickly by talking about what can we do? What, what can we do about this problem? Number one, I would say we need to create communities of opportunity, I call them, to minimize, neutralize, and dismantle the systems of racism that create inequities in health. That means investing in early childhood. There's high quality evidence, such as the Abbott-Darren project in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, that, that took poor kids, 80% of them African-American, at birth, put them into an early uh, nurturing environment, birth through five, 
by age 21, they're doing better academically, doing better health-wise. By the mid-30s, markedly lower levels of cardiovascular disease risk, lower obesity. Here's the systolic blood pressure differences between the treatment group and the control group. Striking differences linked to what in life. Communities of opportunity need to reduce. We have shockingly high levels of childhood poverty in the United States that should be unacceptable to us. But what I want to show you even more powerfully is what do we do about it? Here's a UNICEF report. Here's the childhood poverty in Ireland. The economy in Ireland produces a childhood poverty rate of 42%. That's before taxes and transfers. After the Irish illustrate use their preferences in taxes and transfers, the actual childhood poverty rate is reduced to 8%. And you can see what other countries do. In the US, our economy produces a childhood poverty rate of 24% after taxes and transfers, it's 23%. We're not doing anything uh, about to help our children. There's a recent report from the National Academy of Sciences list number of strategies that can be implemented uh, to reduce childhood poverty in half within the next 10 years. We can do it. We just need the political will to do it. reminds us there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way we treat our children. What else can we do? Communities of opportunity, chance, income, and employment opportunities for young adults. The evidence don't have time to discuss them of strategies that have worked by providing additional income to disadvantaged communities. No health intervention improves health. Here is one quick example, minimum wage. Increasing the state level minimum wage above the federal level by $1 leads to improved birth outcomes in this country and reductions in post neonatal mortality. So we, we know it can be done. What we do we need to improve neighborhood and housing conditions remember it's opportunity at a level of place is the driver i want to share with you an amazing uh uh, uh, uh initiative an intervention uh, called purpose-built communities and show you what they have been able to do by addressing all of the challenges faced by disadvantaged communities simultaneously come with me to east lake meadows atlanta in 1995 uh, African-American public housing project where um, crime was very high, where um, dilapidated housing, only 13% of able-bodied adults employed. Uh, the nearby elementary school was one of the worst performing in the state of Georgia. Come with me to the villages of East Lake today. In a 90% reduction in crime, half the residents qualify for public housing, half are at market rate, all able-bodied persons are employed. Uh, the school, although over percent of the students qualify for reduced price meals, uh, the school is one of the best performing each year in the state of Georgia. And what has Purpose Built done? They've addressed all the challenges simultaneously. They've created comprehensive solutions with an emphasis on quality. Um, they've uh, dealt with the affordability issues for low-income households, and they have surrounded individuals with support services. Importantly, Shirley Franklin, former mayor of Atlanta, is a chairman of board of the board of this organization. They are providing free technical assistance to any community in America who wants to replicate their model. What else do we need to do? I'm, I need to wrap up here quickly. Um, we need to put more health into he health care. What do I mean by that? Well, we need to ensure that everyone has access to quality care and, and, and do whatever we need to do in the policy and voting to make sure that happens. We need to ensure that everyone has ac not just access to, to care, but to high quality care. We need to ensure that people have care that addresses the social context. The World Health Organization asked the question, what do we if all we do is have a health system that treats illness and puts people back to conditions that made them sick in the first place and their efforts to address that. And then this one is profound. We need to di diversify the workforce to meet the needs of all patients. I have to share with you this study. It came out last month. A study of 1.8 million hospital births in Florida between 1992 and 2015. The study found that when cared for white doctors, black babies are three times more likely than white babies to die in the hospital. That disparity is cut in half when black babies are cared for by a black doctor. 
Now, we don't know what are all the conditions this pattern exists for. We don't know all the drivers of it. We think implicit bias may play a role. We think there might be differences in the quality of care. There might be differences in the quality of the patient-provider interaction. But it, it should be an alarm bell in America that this is what is happening. And in 2014, there were 27 fewer African-American males in the first year of medical school in this great country than in 1978. We need to do better. We need to get the the build the ladders of opportunity. The the programs that start at elementary school and middle school that will put our children on the pathway to academic success to meet the needs of their communities. Because there's nothing so unfair as the equal treatment of unequal people, as Plato paraphrased. And finally, quickly, we need to raise awareness levels of inequities and what we can do about them. What are the barriers we need to address? We need to raise awareness levels. COVID-19 has helped, but most P Americans didn't know that disparities existed. More importantly, we need to develop the polit political will to address them, and we need to build empathy so we would have the political will to address them. The research, I, I want to draw on the work of W.E.B. Du Bois, great African-American social scientist of the late 19th century, wrote a book called The Philadelphia Negro, has a chapter on Negro health. As he comes near the chapter describing the disparities in health, in 1899, he says the most difficult social problem in the matter of Negro health is the peculiar attitude of the nation toward the well-being of the race. And he continued, there have been few other cases in the history of civilized peoples where human suffering has been viewed with such peculiar indifference. What Du Bois is saying in plain English is the biggest problem we face is we, as a people, do not care. America does not care about the plight. What he calls the peculiar indifference, scholars today call the empathy gap. It's been demonstrated on every continent, and that is when you show people the suffering of someone, another human being in pain, we feel the pain based on our brain response, our empathic neural responses. We feel the pain of what happens to someone of our group, our racial group, compared to another group. Martin Luther King says, true compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It understands that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. I've been talking tonight for in, in, in the East Coast, so this afternoon in California, about edifices that produces beggars. And I leave you with the words of Robert Kennedy. Each time a man or woman stands up for ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he or she sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. And those ripples can build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. It is my hope that each of you listening to me today will make a new commitment to be a ripple of hope. And together, we can make a difference. This is a moment in which we need to make a difference. Together, we can sweep down the mighty walls of oppression and resistance that have created the inequities that we struggle with. Thank you so much uh, for listening to me today. Thank you so much. Wow, that was fantastic. And I am now happy to invite uh, Dr. Bell and Dr. Hines to join us as well. Um, so Dr. Williams, you talked about the purpose-built communities and how something that was so special about them was they were integrating all of these different pieces into, um, into looking at the impacts of racism. And so just here on this panel, we have expertise in public health, we have expertise in history, we have expertise in African American studies. How can scholars from different areas, and this question is to all of you, um, draw on all of these different um, areas of research to produce interdisciplinary solutions to address these factors of racism that have, as you've shown Dr. Williams, real concrete and severe impacts on communities in this country and worldwide? Um, I can start us off on that question. Uh, and, you know, first, before I even say anything, um, thank you to Dr. Williams for such an excellent keynote. Um, and thank you to Ryle and thank you, Catherine, for, for leading this discussion. Um, I think a, an interdisciplinary approach is really 
critical to understanding these problems because, you know, as Dr. Williams laid out, um, public education uh, and public health are really intimately tied together as projects. And, you know, when we look at that historically, uh, we've known that reality for quite some time. So I was really uh, pleased to see that uh, Dr. Williams brought it back to Du Bois. And, you know, I would add, you know, I study classroom teachers, African American classroom teachers and K 12 classrooms uh, in the early 20th century. And so, um, I, you know, sort of came across the, the work of a much lesser known woman, but, you know, in the 1920s, this woman, Elise McDougal, who was a woman of color and an assistant principal in uh, PS uh, 89 in New York, was speaking to the Urban League, and she said something that I think really still holds true, and she said, the primary aim of education is to promote well-being, and health is of primary importance in attaining that. We lay great stress on the public schools because a child cannot learn if he is not physically well, Right? If he needs glasses, he cannot see and therefore he cannot learn. If he is undernourished, his mind is not alert. If he has diseased tonsils, he may appear dull, but really he is sick. Right? So almost a century ago, uh, Elise and the teachers around her understood those deep connections between public health and public education and the need for bringing uh, expertise in from a wide range of content areas. And you know, when I started teaching junior high in 2007 in Washington, DC, I found the same exact thing. Um, and I think COVID has only really reinforced that reality to so much, uh, so much more, uh, so much of a further extent. So, yeah, I think we, we definitely need a, a wide and a broad approach to the problem. I definitely agree. And um, first, let me say as well, thank you to Dr. Williams, uh, just in terms of a personal point of, <laughs> of connection, my research has been um, largely based on your research. So it's definitely an honor to be on this panel and to discuss with everyone about this topic. I do think that an interdisciplinary approach is required not only to understand, but to develop some of the um, solutions that Dr. Williams talked about. I think about um, this in terms of how we have started talking about racism as a public health problem, right? And this is, even though Dr. Williams has been studying this for a long time, just like he said, the public um, or the broader public might not think about um, or even know about racial inequities in health and definitely not think about racism as a key determinant of the racial inequities that we see. And so this um, term that we use, systemic racism, that's in sociology, right? And so as an instructor, as an educator in public health, I have to use um, multiple um, fields for even students to understand. We definitely need an interdisciplinary approach to address these problems. I also think about um, terms like racial capitalism that has come up recently in thinking about the pandemic when people are wondering, well, we have these huge racial inequities and exposure to um, COVID. It is it's because, of, or one of the reasons why is because of these racial inequities and in the work conditions that people um, of color, Black, um, Latinx, and Indigenous people have. It's just one of the drivers. But people are asking, why do we see these huge racial inequities in employment environments? And that is because of racial capitalism. That term is actually from a political science um, theory started by Cedric Robinson. Um, and it has been applied in other fields like sociology and we're starting to do it in public health. And so I think it's important for us, just like I think Dr. Williams' presentation was an inter interdisciplinary, excuse me, presentation because it had all of these things that are necessary, even thinking about segregation that can be viewed as a public policy issue or even um, public design or excuse me, uh, environmental design, these things are all incorporated into this problem. And I think it's necessary for um, panels like this, the RAL program um, or conference rather to be interdisciplinary to solve these issues. Yeah, I, I completely agree with what my colleagues have said. And um, I, I would just add, it's, it's not just an interdisciplinary approach for us as in academia. Um, this is a moment where we have access to policymakers in a way we haven't had, and and it, it needs a, a interdisciplinary, a, a multi-level uh, policy approach. This is not the domain of, of one department of the government. There, there needs to be um, that kind of uh, policy integration in terms of the kinds of strategies and mobilization we need.
Thank you. And so we've talked about the effect of racism on outcomes from COVID-19. And looking forward, what do you see those long-term impacts being on education? Things the way they are now, uh, which Dr. Williams very clearly laid out. Um, what do these long-term impacts on education look like? Um, I think uh, I think the first impact that we're going to see, and, and indeed something that we're already seeing, um, is students returning to the classroom or to the virtual classroom with trauma. Um, I think you know we know, uh, like Dr. Williams said, that the rates of infection and the, the rates of mortality are higher in communities of color, um, and we're going to have students who are coming back to classrooms who've experienced COVID themselves, whose loved ones have experienced it, um, or students who you know just had uh, different experiences, disruptions like job losses within their families uh, who are dealing with economic insecurity. Uh, so I think that's gonna be the first thing that we're gonna have to deal with and that we're gonna see as ter in terms of long-term impacts. Um, I think also, you know, we're gonna see pretty lasting academic impacts as well. And we have a pretty robust literature on, you know, what happens when students miss in-person class time, um, chronic absenteeism, summer slides, summer learning loss, um, this suggests that students lose ground even between school years in normal circumstances, right? So obviously with the pandemic and students being out of the classroom so much longer, those effects are going to compound. Um, and then the third thing I would, would sort of say is that um, another issue here is unequal access to instruction in the meanwhile or in this interim period before we get back to some sort of uh, new normal. And if we look at what Dr. Williams just shared about race and median household income, I think those concerns become even greater when you think about uh, some of the services that, the, that that income can provide. Um, it's a concern to me, for instance, that families with greater resources are going to be able to set up what are basically alternative school spaces um, through private tutors and through learning pods that many families of color won't have access to. Uh, and I think there's a serious danger there that existing disparities could only you know, widen under those circumstances. I, I totally agree. I think that um, Dr. Williams made a good point um, talking about now we should have the attention of public policy or, or, or politicians and policymakers who are able to implement those changes and hopefully stave off the inequities that will be maximized. Just I agree, um, Dr. Hines, that they will be um, magnified after this um, pandemic is over and while it's happening, I was trying to think on a hopeful note about um, what could change. And one, one of the things that I hope for we have, or the term uh, critical race theory has been in the media for various reasons. However, I hope that in the future, uh, we are able to incorporate this understanding that um, Dr. Williams showed into our um, educational systems, even at the high school level, um, thinking about what students understand about the racial inequities that we see in our country, um, making sure that they know the roots and understand this concept of structural or systemic racism, I think is important to do as early as possible because um, we have public policymakers, we have educators, we have um, our society now, but we're also training and educating um, future adults and even teenagers have are the ones who are leading um, many of the social justice movements that we have now. So making sure that our understanding of these racial inequities is incorporated into education at the high school level, definitely at the college level, and across disciplines going back to this interdisciplinary approach. I, as a public health scholar, I would love to see um, a interdisciplinary approach to understanding racial inequities happen as soon as um, a student starts an MPH or a master's of public health program. I think that's really necessary as well as um, physician education in medical school too. So I'm hoping that things can change to increase um, our population's understanding of these issues. I believe that I'll tell you what I'm worried about. Um, the, the reports documenting the depth of this economic reception 
and the uneven recovery. Whites have, have regained jobs at a much higher rate than African Americans and, and Latinos, for example. Um, and and the, the, the systems that have been put in place, I, I showed you the data of where people were before the pandemic hit, hit where they were in income and where they were with, with wealth. When you have no wealth, you, you, you don't have reserves um to to pay the rent you don't have reserves and then you then on top of that you've had a loss of life and the loss of income uh from members of your household who got covid-19 even those who who survive so i i worry about the the inability of many population uh communities of color to maintain utilities to maintain a a place to live um I, and i think that that moving forward when we um, make available uh, resources to to populations that are struggling. We need to pay attention not just to income but to assets. Because if we don't pay attention to wealth, we are overstating the, the economic resources that people have. So I, I worry about what this is going to mean uh, when when we when we bottom out of this economic crisis that we're in, and what that will mean for for learning, for children, for communities, for entire uh, schools of what, what this will mean uh, for them. And and I, I hope that everyone who has voted has voted we need to vote and that's a start but of, of the movement we need but we need to vote and so we only have a couple minutes left but um i want to pick up on something that dr bell said about what are, what are the hopeful notes here what you know we have quite a few people here watching this, people who are from all of these dis different disciplines who are hearing this, who are invested in this topic. Um, what are some of the things moving forward that scholars, politicians, educators can be doing and thinking about to, um, to use your phrase of in educating the next generation of adults? Um, what are some of the things that we can be doing now to prepare that next generation of adults? Okay, I'll, I'll I'm let like, you know, then I'm in. Um, I, for me, I, I think it's most important for us to, or I'll take a step back. I was, one of the things that I'm thinking about as we're having these conversations, especially as Dr. Williams um, showed the slides about stress and all of the um, ways that that impacts um, African-American health is that we're dealing with so much um, in, in this country or globally, right? We have a pandemic, we have political um, changes that uh, could be happening. We have uh, the pandemic, racism, we have police brutality, all of these things are happening at the same time. And so thinking about, well, where do we want to go we again have to be interdisciplinary, we have to be multi-layered, we have to actually make action, we have to make um, to make changes. And I, I think that it's important for us to, to, to do that, to, to reach for those goals. Sometimes we can say it, it can't happen, it's too much, it's, it's not gonna happen, incremental change, all of those types of arguments, but to actually um, educate and show younger people that action has to happen. We may not get the results that we want, but it's still the right thing to do. It's right. It's always right to fight against injustice. It's always right to fight against inequities. And so for me as an educator, that is what I want my students and generations behind me to, to take away that it's always right to do action based on these inequities. So for me, it's just not about the educating the students or educating um, people, it's about teaching them these sort of life lessons about what we do about injustice and about inequities, and that is fight against it and move forward. Yeah, um, I think that, you know, I, I agree so much with what Dr. Bell just said. Um, and I think, you know, this pandemic has been, you know, a lot of failures sort of combined into one, right? We've had um, failures of governance, failures of decision making, failures of public trust, failures of empathy. Um, and what I would like to do, um, or what I would be excited to do uh, if I was back in a K-12 classroom would be to sit down with students 
um, and discuss how those failures occurred and sort of take like an sort of an action civics model approach to it where um, students are being trained to like analyze and recognize systems of oppression, but are also being given the tools to go out there and have strategies for how to intervene and how to in enact change, right? Um, so that when they, uh, when they leave the classroom, they feel more equipped to take on those challenges. Um, and I think that, you know, tying back to the, um, to the comments yesterday and the keynote yesterday, um, we have those stories of survival, right? We have stories of trauma, but we also have stories of survival. Um, and we have intergenerational stories that carry over um, that can really fuel us, you know, in this moment as well. Yeah, I, I, I agree with the points that have been made. I, I would emphasize that even for all the stress that, that, that um, uh, we see, there's research that suggests there are some things that, that can reduce some of the negative effects of stress, the quality of social ties. Um, there, there's some research on that, the, the um, uh, community, sense of community. Um, and and uh, even studies have looked at the role of religious engagement that 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 seems to reduce some of the negative stress and discrimination health. Uh, there's some work out of Canada showing that um, uh, 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 actually political empowerment and protest and, and for the rights and and celebrating one's culture um, actually mock could lead, improve the mental health of, of young people in those First Nations communities. So there, there are lots of things that we need to do. Of course, we need to get to the, the source of the problem and, and dismantle it. The, the, the key point I would want to leave everyone listening to tonight with, we are in a different moment. We, we cannot let this moment go to waste. I, I would say in my entire career uh, of the 30 plus years I'm in this space, I have not spoken to as many major corporations who want to understand racism. Um, you know, uh, th this is a new moment. We, you look at news and there are investments being made by major companies to address racial justice. Um, uh, 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 this crisis is a terrible thing to waste. And, and, and we need to, to come together and maximize this moment because it may not come back is that strategically, hopefully, with a newly and a newly elected representatives at a national level, that we will build on this moment and this momentum to try to make a change that we haven't made before. Thank you, and that is a fantastic note to end on. Thank you so much to our panelists today. Thank you for sharing your expertise with us, and I will pass it back to Dr. Ball to wrap us up. Thank you so much, Kath Catherine. Thank you, uh, Dr. Williams, Dr. Hines, Dr. Bell. Thank you so much for that stimulating, thought-provoking presentation. The points that you brought up are so important. As Dr. Williams has said, we are in a different moment. We are in a different place. He also said, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. So as educational researchers, we need to think about that as well. We're waiting for Zoom to come to an end. What we need to be doing is thinking about how we are going to address things differently in terms of work, our work as, as, as researchers, as educators. As you can see when Dr. Williams talked about the health implications, uh, policy implications, all of these things reflect on what goes on educationally. And even if these people, even if we had higher levels of education, we were still uh, had a, 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 a reduced lifespan. And so this is serious. This is, we are in serious times. We need to use COVID-19 as an opportunity to look at things differently. And so as our third day, as our fourth day of discussions about critical issues related to race, inequality and language, health, all of these issues relate to education, we should be motivated to really realize that there's some serious things that we need 
to be doing. We need to question ourselves. And as I've encouraged at the end of each of our day's discussions, we need to continue these conversations. And so to those of you who uh, are zooming in, find someone to talk to. Continue these conversations, look at the work of each of these scholars and build upon it and realize we are not going back to the way things used to be. We need to look forward. Which takes us to tomorrow's presentation. Tomorrow, we will have education's hard reset and where education needs to go from here. We have been challenged. There is work to be done. We will have Dr. Gloria Latson Billings, Dr. Ramon R uh, uh, Martinez, and Dr. Savannah Shrain Shran will be here speaking to us about these very, very important issues. And so as we come to a close, I encourage you to come again tomorrow. We'll meet you at the same place, same time, 3 p.m. And until then, we wish you peace, innovation in your thinking, generativity. And remember, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. Let's do something with this crisis so that our students in all schools and all communities can have quality education. Thank you.